Hi, welcome to the Extension Network. My name is Renee Lemon. I am the Master Gardener Coordinator for Cobb County, and I'm with Terry Carter, mm -hmm. who uh, is a Master Gardener, but she also is part of our Family and Consumer Science Department at Extension. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to talk about two things. One is the Master Gardener training that will start January of 2018, and I have the application right here. Um, you can find it online at cobmastergardeners.com or you can call the office at 770-528-4070 and we'll mail you an application or you can drop by the office and we'll print you one. So the classes are from January the 10th until April the 4th, 2018. The deadline for the application is October 2nd, 2017. So you have several months to get the application in. We are also going to have a little meet and greet on July the 20th at Cobb County Extension. And the title of that is, What Does It Mean to Be a Master Gardener? So you can come to Extension from, at 10 o'clock. It'll last until about noon. And we'll talk about what it is to be a Cobb County Master Gardener. Now Terry <laughs> became a Master Gardener first. And as she um, was at the office answering phones and answering questions, she sort of fell in love with hanging out at the office. <laughs> Tell us about your experience, Terry. Well, uh, master gardening, first of all, has been rewarding to me. It's been amazing. It has changed my life tremendously. And I started this journey um, because I was a stay-home mom, and I said, you know, what can I do that I love to do and I can also give back? And I thought about gardening and I thought about cooking, and to me, they go hand in hand. And so, um, I looked at this program called the Master Gardener Program of Cobb County, and I had seen this program several years before and um, had applied and I didn't get in. And so once Renee took over the program, I came back, I saw her and talked to her. She's an amazing person and um, put my application in and I ended up getting accepted into the Master Gardener Program. And it just really changed me so much because coming to the office, which we're all required to do um, time in the office, 25 hours, what, is it 25 or 50 hours we had to initially do? The first year is 30. 30 hours, okay. Mm -hmm. At, on the phones. On the phones. Mm -hmm. So I had to come into the office to do that volunteer work on the phones. And it really helps you when you do that because you get to answer questions. You learn because you're answering questions that you don't have the answer to. So as you go, you're helping people, but you're also learning people. And the extension office was such a wonderful environment. Everybody was peaceful and quiet and happy. And I really enjoyed it. So I started thinking if I have to go back to work, I would love to work here. So just in passing, what did I say, Renee? I was like, uh, Renee, if by chance y'all have an opening here, can you let me know? <laughs> and Renee's like, yeah, I sure will. Didn't think much about it, but um, a part-time position did come open in the Family and Consumer Science Department, which involves cooking. So for me, it was just like a marriage of the two things I do best, being able to be a cob master gardener and then being able to work at the extension office uh, with the food because um, growing food and preparing food, pre growing food, preserving food and preparing food, to me all go hand in hand. So to be able to learn how to do all of that and then to put that knowledge um, into practice has just been tremendous for me. The um, response in the community has been amazing. So um, not only do I look at seeds, I start with seeds because I like to grow everything from seeds um, instead of buying transplants. So through the Master Gardener program, I've learned how to do all that and do it well. And I've also been able to share my knowledge with a lot of other people. Uh, I guess I'm somewhat of a consultant um, being a Master Gardener because people come up to me all the time and they go, you know what? I want to learn how to garden, but I don't know how. And so they see these TV shows that we do and me working with the community gardens and people say, you know what, um, I really want to learn. So I think being a master gardener has really been, been ins inspiring to other people. So I feel good about that, that they look at me as someone who is a gardener now and that um, I can show them how to do it. So for me, it's learning every day because it's always a different problem. And there are so many master gardeners in Cobb County. It's nice to know people and get to know different people because every master gardener's background is different. But we all love the same thing, which is gardening. 
So for us, it's just wonderful to have over 300, I think, Master Gardeners mm -hmm. we have now in Cobb County. That's right. And growing every right. year. So, yep. um, yes, it's wonderful. And I encourage anyone who's interested in gardening, who loves gardening, um, and who has the time. That's the main thing. As a Master Gardener, it's a volunteer position. So you need to have that time to be able to go out into the community and volunteer. So for me, um, my volunteering with Master Gardener, since I'm working full time now, is through um, community gardening. So. Um, I work with our wonderful Reconnecting Our Roots Community Garden, which is right downtown um, in Marietta that the Cobb Master Gardener sponsor. Um, working in there, going out, we have three boxes in there, um, three raised beds rather, in that garden. And so um, I've planted some very rare tomatoes in those um, boxes and I'm really excited to see what they're going to turn out. And we'll come back probably next month once those tomatoes are ready and we'll do um, a show from the garden and use them actually in the recipe to show people that you can grow stuff from seed, you can watch it grow, harvest it, and then use it in your everyday cooking. And that's going to supplement your food and that's going to cut down on your food bill. So growing food is a wonderful process, it's therapeutic, saves money, and it's just fun to do. So I love it. Isn't Terry fantastic? <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, our Cobb County Master Gardener and Family and Consumer Science staff member, um, is going to talk to you after our break about food history of the South. So once again, if you want to get this application, go to CobbMasterGardeners.com and it will be above the fold on the website. Also, you can call the office at 770-528 4070. So after the break, we're going to learn a little bit about food history from mm -hmm. Terry. Thank you. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him opening his own clothing store at the age of 18? One in 138,000. Excited to be a part of pop culture, he packed for the big city. The odds of finding someone to invest in his vision? One in 4.5 million. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 88. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Early diagnosis can make a lifetime of difference. But it wouldn't be safe to keep your distance until they're not secret to make you smile. Why do sources say that chicken soup has proved it's found their way out of this year? Getting closer to nature can get you closer to your family. Go to discovertheforest.org. Thank you. 
We're back here, um, and I'm going to be talking about the food history of the South. Um, for me, the food history of the South ties in very well with what we were talking about earlier today with Renee and community gardening. Because um, when you grow food, you preserve food, and you cook food, you have completed the whole process um, of food. So for me, being able to, uh, to do all of that is really important. But what we want to focus on today um, in this segment is the food history of the South. How did these things, which we consider Southern food staples, actually become these staples of the South? Where did they come from and how did they get so ingrained in our society? Um, for me to do that, I really had to go back and look at history of America in order to tie this whole food thing in together. And what I found was that when you research food history, you're actually researching the history of America and how it all came together. So what I'm going to try and do for you today is take you all the way back and take a look at how all of this came together and why these food staples, which I have here today, and we'll talk about all those a little later, why they came, why they became standouts in our uh, food culture. So in order to do that, I went back and looked at um, the beginning of this and I said, well, where is the beginning? Is the beginning um, in 1960? Is it 1900s? Is it 1800s? Where did all this really begin? And so I went all the way back to Africa and I found it easier to do it that way. And I started looking at um, the enslaved people who came over um, on those slave ships. And I said, well, what were they eating on the slave ships? And we found that um, when those slave ships docked in Africa, they would often have um, provisions that they got from China, but sometimes those provisions would also come from Africa, meaning that um, they would provide rice, they would provide millet, they would provide uh, sorghum. And so these things would be put on the slave ships and the women actually who were on those slave ships, they were responsible for feeding everyone on the slave ships. It didn't, depend, it didn't matter how many slaves were on that ship, they had to be fed. And the ironic part about it is, if these women didn't cook, then guess what? They wouldn't get fed. So you would have brothers, sisters, um, cousins, people you knew who would starve to death. So they immediately had this job of cooking for everyone on the ship. And so a lot of times the provisions that they had would be ungrain, unmilled grain. So that means they would have to mill it, they would have to husk it. Uh, meaning prepare it before it was cooked. This was a very labor intensive job. Okay, so once these women arrived in the Americas, in South America, Central America, um, they were in a new land, but once again, everybody had to be fed. So once they arrived here, they found that it was slightly different. So the foods they had been eating in Africa was different. Um, also, the land was different. So they tried to grow some of the things, one being cassava, uh, which is a staple. Cassava would not grow in North America. It would grow some in uh, South and Central America, but not in North America. So what happened with that was it started to be replaced by other grains. Um, so we want to look at what the Native Americans were doing um, and what Europeans brought to America. So uh, we already had Native Americans here, we know, in the states that were living here. And what the Native Americans were primarily eating was corn. Corn was a big staple. It had um, a use in everyday eating. It would be eaten um, as corn on the cob. It would also be milled into a grain and the cob would be used for fuel, also be used for making a pipe. So they had a method called the three sisters planting method. And what that is, is you have beans, you have corn, and then you have squash. And it's called the three sisters because each one of them have a different purpose. So you have the corn, which grows straight up. Um, then you have the beans that will wrap around the corn and grow. And then you have, and also the beans will provide nitrogen to the soil, so it will keep the soil healthy. And then you will have the squash that will grow along the ground, and that will provide shade. Therefore, you wouldn't get a lot of um, uh, weeds growing in. So this system worked very well. When the first Europeans arrived here um, at a time, they couldn't really grow anything. They actually ended up much further north than they expected, so it, it ended up being wintertime. So they had to rely on the Native Americans to provide food for them and also to teach them how to grow food. So now you have the Native Americans here, you have the um, uh, Europeans here, and what Europeans brought primarily to America as far as the food scene was um, domesticated cattle. Prior to that time, you had the Native Americans who were primarily gatherers and hunters, meaning that they hunted buffalo, they hunted um, small game, but they didn't keep any animals in an encaged area. So 
With the Europeans arriving, we now have domesticated animals, meaning domesticated pigs and um, also cows and other animals. So the scene was kind of changing here. And with that also, we had clashes with the uh, Europeans as well as the Native Americans. And then you throw in the African Americans here. They're here now on these plantations and they're growing food. But a lot of times the food that they're growing is not the food that they would eat. So they would have to primarily provide food for themselves because they were given a diet from the, um, from the plantation owners basically of cornmeal, pork fat, and sometime maybe um, fish, occasionally some uh, fish, but most of the time it was primarily um, fat back meat as well as the um, corn. So with that, that's, that's a diet that's not really sustainable. So what they ended up doing was having to have their own gardens and during the time that they were not working and they were working from pretty much sun up to sundown, they would have their own small gardens and they would grow a lot of vegetables in those gardens. And with that being said, it kind of brings us to where we are today. But how did this become still um, a diet of not just the African American slaves, but also all of Americans? Well, to, to explain that to you, we have to look at what was going on um, after slavery around 1900. Georgia, Georgia was um, really an export state. We exported a lot of vegetables, we exported um, tobacco, corn. Um, we had a lot of things that we were trading, but things were going on in the world that would change all that for, for Georgia. Um, for one, you had manufacturing in the north, so people were starting to move to the north and you had a lot of jobs there. So you also had the demise of the South because of the boll weevil. The boll weevil came into existence and it prevented um, people from earning a living because it infested the cotton um, industry. So you could no longer grow cotton and with the boll weevil you also had um, competition from outside of the United States so that drove prices down. Um, then you also had a drought that lasted over three years, so people really couldn't grow anything anymore. And then on top of that, we also had new forms of fabric. You had man-made fabrics, rayon and polyester and things like that coming into play. So all of a sudden now the South has changed. So all of these farmers who were young, who were farmers able to earn a living for themselves, they no longer could do that. So they were forced to shut down their farms and move north, and if they didn't move south, if they didn't move north, they were faced with a situation where we're unable to feed ourselves, and now they're being forced to eat the same food that sharecroppers and former slaves were eating. So now this is how all of this comes into play, because the um, enslaved people over the years had learned how to grow foods. They had learned what would grow here, and they had pretty much perfected it. So when all of this came about with the uh, cotton and the bow weevil, um, people in the rural South that were able to have their own farms, mostly middle-class white people, now they were faced with an entirely different situation. Not being able to have a farm, which means no income. They didn't have, um, a lot of them didn't have indoor bathroom, um, indoor plumbing. So now they're put on a level where they have to start to look at what can we eat to survive and hence here's our southern and our soul food coming into play. Once again the um, enslaved Africans, um, sharecroppers and then free slaves had already perfected this so they knew what would grow in the south, what needed how much uh, water to grow and so they had kind of put this into play and now um, Rural white, white America is depending on these same things um, to eat as a form of survival. So hence we have these things that we're still able to grow in small portions. So we want to look at some of the things we have here that are our traditional foods and how they came about. Um, I guess I want to start with first of all the cow peas or dried field peas. Field peas were one of the things that um, poor sharecroppers and enslaved people would grow a lot because field peas were easy to grow. They didn't require a lot of water. They were easily, easily to pick and you could eat these either fresh or you could dry them out and eat them later. So you were able to eat them in season and then dry them out. And so uh, for future in the winter time, you would still have these peas. These are small peas and um, they're called cow peas because a lot of times these things will be fed to the cows um, to supplement their diet. Um, and then also with the field peas, we have one of my favorite things, which are the collard greens. Now collard greens, field peas are grown in the spring and throughout the summer. Um, collard greens 
pick up in the winter time. So with the collard greens, you start growing those around September. They can go, you put them in the ground around September and they can grow pretty much through the winter months here in the South. So we have a very special um, agricultural scene here in the South that we can pretty much grow here year round. We can grow something here pretty much year round. So the collard greens became very important along with mustard greens, turnip greens and cabbages because you could plant them in the fall, harvest them throughout winter. And a lot of times with the collard greens, you didn't even have to pull up the whole plant. You could just take um, one of the stems, snap the stem off and the plant will continue to grow. So that plant will produce food for you throughout the winter. Um, so collard greens became very important. And the way the collard greens were traditionally prepared would have been with pork fat, because pork fat, meaning the um, uh, hog knuckle, which is the um, lower part of the ankle of the hog, was something that would have been thrown away by the plantation owners. So this is something that they would have given the slaves or sharecroppers. So that would be used to season the collard greens. And a lot of people think that they were just eating it, but that was more so for seasoning. Somebody would eat it eventually um, if it was left in the pot, but your seasoning meats became very, very important with your greens. So um, today what I brought to, um, to show you to season the greens with is not pork because we have a lot of people who don't eat pork anymore. So what I have brought is a turkey tail. So turkey is now um, something that you can season your greens with because you have turkey tails, which is my preference. And a lot of people laugh at that, but I like the turkey tail because it has more fat on it, which renders more flavor to your greens. You also have turkey necks, turkey legs, turkey wings. All those things can be used if you don't want to use pork. OK, but it is smoked and the smoke flavor of it really imparts a nice um, flavor to your greens. Now, greens are very easy to um, uh, grow and as well um, easy to prepare. You simply take your greens like this and you will strip them from your um, stem, leave that stem intact. Some people actually cook some of the stem because they have what you call pot liquor. And that is the um, liquid from the greens has a lot of nutrients in it. So a lot of people leave those stems in there. I personally take them out because um, even though they were cooked out, I just don't like the taste of them. But if you want to, you could leave them in there. And also one of the things that could be grown um, as well would be sweet potatoes. Now the sweet potatoes you see there is a simple way of just basically baking the sweet potato and they would actually put that sweet potato um, in the fire if they were working in the fields and enslaved people would and let it cook and let it char because sweet potatoes really don't take that long um, to cook. So the sweet potato became a staple because no longer were these enslaved Africans able to um, grow other things that they had in Africa. So the sweet potato was supposed to take the place. When you hear the term yam, a yam is actually not what uh, we call, what a yam is a different uh, vegetable or fruit than the sweet potato. We use that term interchangeably, but a yam is something entirely different and it's not sweet. But we say candy yams, but it's actually a sweet potato and not a yam. Uh, but the sweet potato is very versatile because it was stored very well. You could do a lot of different things with it. Um, as I said, in this case, we've just taken the sweet potato, um, baked it, and you could add some butter to that. You can add a little bit of um, sugar if you want a little bit more sweetener to it. Um, you could even add some candied pecans to it. And also with the sweet potato, I've made a healthier version of um, our sweet potato pot or candy yams. So I'm not adding very much sugar to this right here. So basically I've taken a graham cracker crust um, and I got the smaller ones. And I basically took the sweet potato after I cooked it and I did boil these instead of baking them, but you could bake them or boil them, it's up to you. And I added some um, cinnamon and allspice to it, a little bit of butter and just a little bit of sweetness. So it's actually a much healthier version of a sweet potato pie or candy yams. So what I'm trying to show you is that um, even though these are staples, of our past and a lot of times they're considered unhealthy. You can eat much ver uh, healthier versions of all of these foods today. There's nothing wrong with that. I see people eating really fancy, but if you go back to your basic diet and you're growing food here close to you, eating organically, that's a very healthy diet. And that's all that you need to do without a lot of additives. Also, we have on the plate some fresh sliced tomatoes, which tomatoes of, of course grow very well here in Georgia. Um, from probably May on until our first frost. Okay, and then also we have something on here that a lot of you may not have heard of, and here it is here. I made a big plate of them because I'm gonna share them with my coworkers when I go back. But these um, can be called a lot of different things, but basically my grandmother called them whole cakes, okay? And a whole cake is basically um, just 
cornmeal with your um, egg and in old days they didn't a lot of time put egg in that they would do it cornmeal and hot water and it was called hot water cornbread okay so we have that and also a lot of rice would have been grown so we have different varieties of rice here we have our black rice as well as our red rice here those things would have been grown so today we don't see a lot of different kinds of rice just basically our white rice but um, in South Carolina there was a lot of rice being grown that were of different varieties and also we have apples apples would have come in season in the fall and I dried these apples because um, you have to be able to preserve food for the future and drying um, apples and other fruits is a great way of uh, preserving food. So we have our dried apples and one thing we also have here is we have uh, yellow root and yellow root was used as a medicine because it healed a lot of different things and you can still purchase yellow root. You take those um, uh, roots and you put them in water and boil them and then you drink the tonic from that and it actually has a very um, yellow color. So these are all things that we consider um, food staples of the South. So I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope that you've learned something as well um, about our food history. And it is a very rich and proud history. And Georgia is one of the most um, productive states in the United States as far as producing food. So I'm very proud to be part of this food history of the South. And if you have any questions or you want some recipes, please don't hesitate to call us at the Extension Office. We'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Oh yeah, yeah. Did you guys know statistically friendly kids have more friends? Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. Severe weather can destroy a home in seconds. There's no time to think, only time to act. Have a kit so you're ready for any emergency. Develop a plan for what you and your family will do before disaster strikes. And stay informed during severe weather any way you can. It can be the difference between losing your possessions and losing your life. Just ask the owners of this house. Visit weather.com ready and let the Weather Channel help you prepare your family for emergencies. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. You can't control where the ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. Jack Frost, you do have beautiful teeth. My, my what? Are they really as white as they say? Yes. <gasps> oh, they really do sparkle like freshly fallen snow. This is an excellent example of what teeth should look like. Check out the iridescence of that incisor. The beauty of that bicuspid. The magnificence of those molars. <laughs> and the best way to achieve such terrific teeth is brushing. Two minutes, twice a day. Not 30 seconds, not a minute, 45. Two minutes. That's all it takes. They're beautiful.